I gotta tell you, it's one of the great lies of my life because we were scared to death as we saw those German shepherds and the, and the police looking out the seventh and eighth floor windows of the Hilton down at the, at the uh, National Guard and the, the police down below us. Um, I mean, you, you had a feeling that you were in an armed camp, that there had been a coup, that you, this was no longer a democratic uh, society, that you had, in essence, kind of a dictatorship uh, in Chicago at that point. Well, I was elected president of the National Student Association in 1961, in August. And the next month was the first uh, meeting of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in Jackson, Mississippi. <clears throat> so as a uh, member of, or as a president of the National Student Association, we were uh, ex officio members of the board of, of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. And so I flew down to Jackson, Mississippi and uh, arrived at the airport got in a cab and asked to be taken to the SNCC headquarters and the cab driver slammed on his brakes and said, you mean you want me to take you down there with the niggers? I said, no, no, I want you to take me down there with the, the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He said, yeah, that's exactly what I mean. So he took off, his tires screeching, stopped the car all of a sudden outside the SNCC headquarters and said, you know, get out, that's it. But we stayed in, in, with uh, black families in Jackson as we had meetings and there was one restaurant in the Jackson area that was integrated because the, the authorities in Jackson wanted to have a place where the Freedom Riders could eat without uh, you know, bothering the good citizens of, of uh, Mississippi. So at the middle of the SNCC meeting, the police came to the door and said, it was no longer an integrated restaurant. And if any whites went across the street to that restaurant, they'd be arrested. So we talked about it at that time and decided to to, ch to challenge them and we sang We Shall Overcome and then as we walked past the German Shepherds and the, and the cops in their, in their uh, riot gear, we, we were singing we, we Are Not Afraid. And I gotta tell you, it's one of the great lies of my life because we were scared to death as we saw those German Shepherds and the, and the police. So this was 1961, long before the March on Selma and uh, Mississippi burning and so on. So it was a dangerous time in, in Mississippi. Um, we didn't take it lightly when we decided we were going to challenge the police uh, because we thought, you know, well, we just weren't sure what was going to happen. Uh, when we did walk across the street, some of the older black citizens who were in there would say, well, thank you for doing what you're doing, but you ought to get out of here because we haven't had a lynching here in two or three years. You know, let's not stir them up. I mean, so there was this a fear of, uh, of what was going on with, uh, within the white community. It was also a time where you know, those of us who were in SNCC thought of Martin Luther King uh, Jr. as being way too conservative. Um, you know, we met King uh, at the, uh, in the YWCA where he had lunch uh, quite often. Had no idea, of course, who he was to become a, a, as a great leader in the, in the country's history. But we saw him as being too conservative because he didn't want to take on the, the authorities in a full-scale battle. He wanted to bring the black churches with him in the process in the white churches to support the idea of an integrated society. So his brilliance was in, in tempering the attitude of the young people who said, we can solve all this tomorrow by simply having a huge uh, vote in or wait in or, or sit in uh, throughout the South and, and take on the authorities. King was smart enough to realize that the, the forces on the other side were much too strong and it would probably kill the civil rights movement. So it's not unlike the attitude in Chicago during the Democratic Convention, that those who were in power uh, saw themselves as the keepers of the peace, not the uh, protectors of those who wanted to demonstrate. The summer of 1968, uh, I was on a Ford Foundation program scholarship with the University of Wisconsin Law School, where they asked law students to go to major cities and ride along with the cops to get us some idea of what it means to be a, a policeman on the front lines and presumably to let the police talk to law students about the law. I quickly found out when I went to Chicago that the cops didn't want to hear what I had to say about uh, law enforcement, but it was an interesting experience from my point of view. And it was interesting in part because we knew that the Democratic Convention was going to be held in Chicago, and I was with the 
human rights section of the Chicago Police Department. And their job was to make contact with the various student groups that were going to be uh, demonstrating against the Democratic Convention and to see if there could be some go-betweens to make sure we wouldn't have violence. But uh, about a week before the convention, the Daily uh, Machine put the word out that that was no longer going to be a priority, that it was going to be a military confrontation with students and, and others who were coming into Chicago. So the people I was riding around with to talk to students about having open lines of communication were cut off and our, uh, our whole group was dis assigned to drive police reserve buses uh, to be able to pick up students and put them in jail. Uh, so when, when the convention began, there was absolutely no really open channels between the demonstrators and the, the authorities. And it led to an immediate uh, confrontation in Grant Park where um, some of the police officers took their badges off and their, their names off and started beating on the students. Our people actually called headquarters to say that there were some policemen down there who had taken off their identification. Somebody had to do something about it, and of course the, the, the answer was that's what they're supposed to be doing, is taking on the, the uh, students directly. Um, I found that the experience in Chicago, coming to the police headquarters every day to get in with our, uh, the car to drive around uh, Chicago for 12 hours, was fascinating in part because the, the attitude of the officers who were surrounding the police department uh, at first were sort of friendly and chit-chatty with me about the University of Wisconsin and what we're doing and so on. But as the tensions mounted, I remember coming back one night and one of the policemen outside said, you know, you look like a hippie to me as well. I might want to take a couple of shots at you. And I said, well, why don't you wait for somebody else to come along? But there, you can just feel the tension building. And uh, because the, the Chicago Police Department uh, section on human rights had a decent relationship with the media, when we heard that the word was coming down from the daily folks to go after the news media, uh, I went with one of our police officers to all the TV stations to tell them that they should take some extra security with them because they were going to be attacked that, uh, that night by the, uh, by the Chicago police. They actually didn't believe us because they thought they wouldn't possibly take on the, the, the major media that way, but of course they did. And uh, you, you saw the cameras that were smashed and you know some of the beatings that took place and the tear gassing and, and the like. It was clear that something had gone terribly wrong in Chicago and the Daily Administration and others said, well, why don't we take a look at what happened? And the Walker Commission, as they looked at it, said it was a police riot and that the police themselves were the ones who were, were causing the confrontation and the difficulties with the demonstrators, not the other way around. Uh, most people didn't want to believe that because you, you'd like to think that the police are there to, to maintain order, not to cause chaos. I marched with uh, Jesse Jackson, and I'll tell you one funny story. We were arguing, Jesse was arguing that the Major League Baseball does not hire blacks, women, and Hispanics for off-field positions for general manager, public relations, CEO, and so on. So uh, I was invited to join him uh, picketing in Camden Yards at, in Baltimore. So we met with about 50 black ministers and we, we gathered together outside the, the ballpark and we picketed uh, in favor of hiring of blacks, uh, women, and Hispanics in, in the front office. And uh, I was marching next to Jesse and my, he's a lot taller than I am and my, I was, we were linked arms and after about a half an hour, I said, Jesse, I gotta, I gotta drop out for a minute. He said, why? I said, my arm's killing me. You're taller than I am. And he said, I can't let you go. And I said, why not? And he said, look around, you're the only white boy I got. <laughs> and he said, this is a pretty mean looking audience. I think they're gonna be madder at you than they are at me. So he did it with a twinkle in his eye, of course. And then Al Sharpton came and took my other arm. I said, well, this takes care of it. <laughs> the first battle that we fought was uh, over the whole question of whether the NFL would start to hire blacks as coaches, assistant coaches, head coaches, the so-called thinking positions.